Well, hello, my sweet peeps. Good afternoon, there's Nasty Nathaniel. We're over here at the city council chamber in the Royal Grande. We're gonna go ahead and document the city council meeting this morning. This afternoon, it starts at six o'clock. Uh, and uh, apparently what they've done is they've changed the public speaking time from three minutes to one minute. And we are going to voice our opinion regarding this change of the public speaking time. So stay tuned. Nasty and Nathaniel and I are here to redress our government on this issue. And uh, we might be going live. So he's giving you some history about it. Let's go over here. Said it used to be a fire station. So it used to be a fire station? Is that what you said? It used to be the fire station, yeah. Oh, okay. Nate always does his homework, unlike myself. Okay, it's better to. I'm a history nerd. History nerd, he is. Got some people showing up here for the meeting. It's going to go live over here. We have to Why sign up. Oh, you did deliver it. Okay. I'm assuming. I don't know how to. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. Do we have to sign up to speak? No. No? So what you'll do is just, when it's ready, when uh, the public comment mm -hmm. opens up, you can come in and... Oh, okay, so there's no sign up process. No. Okay, awesome. Thank yeah. you for that info. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that's pleasant. So you yeah. don't have to sign up. Yeah. That's good. Take a seat. There's the mayor over there. Huh? The mayor. Oh, the guy was. Are you stay with that? Do you want to sit down? Yeah. Bill. That's the mayor right there. It's a we have the mayor right here. I don't know anything about who's running in your city. Yeah, Alright, everybody. Yeah, we are on the I'm going to be honest with you folks, uh, this is actually my first um, city hall meeting. I know uh, Denver Metro, it was just a meeting. 
City Hall meeting. So if anybody um, can maybe reach out to uh, and let him know that uh, I'm here with Katie Kidman. Although I wish I was here with Parker Osmond. Hey, Katie. Oh, hey. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, thanks for that. But, uh, like I, I love said, you a long time. First, uh, um, if I have oh, a little okay. um, All right. problem okay. seeing the chat, I've been having some difficulties with uh, my eyes. It's been kind of swollen lately, so it's a little, a little blurry. This one right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's, so, uh, uh, the joys of uh, diabetes. It's like city council meetings here. So we don't have to sign up um, to speak. Um, what you call it? Uh, three minutes to speak. I think uh, in Inglewood, where DMA has been going to a lot. Uh, but what they want to do is they want to cut it down to 60 seconds. That needs to. Um, and uh, Katie Kidman was actually the one that sent me the, the, the link about this. And, uh, she hit me up about 3:30 this afternoon, and I'm, uh, she was. Uh, way down in Buellton, and you know, I'm up in Santa Maria, well, now we're up in Arroyo Grande, so I'm down in Santa Maria, but, um, so yeah, this is what we're here for today, we're going to kind of, uh, I don't know if they're going to give us 60 seconds, and then please bear with me, folks, uh, as long, I've been doing First Amendment activism for almost 10 years now, and I, I've never spoken at City Hall meetings, so, uh, uh, I guess, I guess I need a whooping. <laughs> Well, if it's a handsome one, I guess that'd be fine. So, um, Everything's going pretty well so far. Nate is live over here. What time is it? Do you collecting know people here. Is it six yet? Let me see. The historic part of the city. They kind of try to preserve it to like look like it did in the Old West. We still got a couple minutes, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody suddenly got quiet, so I'm like, <laughs> like the library got quiet. So, uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to this. We've got a, the different uh, people with the city here. Council members, the mayor, and uh, Mayor Pro. We're both mayors. Council members, city attorney, deputy, city manager. Well, these people should all be very familiar with the First Amendment. I think so. So we'll see. Looks like we got somebody outside over here. Law enforcement. All right, everyone, welcome back. The council has returned from closed session. This is Monday, September 9th, special meeting of the Royal Party City Council. Can we get a roll call, please? Council Member Seacrest? Here. Council Member Barnage? Here. Mayor Pertem Guthrie? Here. Mayor Ray Messam? Here. And Council Member George is absent. Thank you. Would you please silently join me in a moment of reflection? Please join me in the flag salute. Mm -hmm. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to Uh, thank you, Mayor, for the closed session items that were read into the record at 5 p.m. Uh, for uh, subsection A, uh, with regards to existing litigation, litigation, the city voted 5-0 to opt out of the settlement class for both listed sites read into the record, City of Camden at all, the BASF Corporation, and also City of Camden at all, the Tyco Fire Products LP, 
uh, by opting out of the proposed settlement classes for full uh, cases, the city preserves its right to take potential future action if necessary associated with any PFAS, that's microplastics, in the city's water supply if any are found in the future. And uh, apologies, there's no reportable action on the real property negotiation closed session. Thank you. Item 5B, we have no uh, ordinances tonight, so we will go ahead and skip that and move straight to special presentations. Our first one is the Honorary Proclamation declaring September 15th through October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month. And with us tonight, we have the Honorable San Luis Obispo Vice Mayor, Andy Pease, who is also the Secretary for the Latino Outreach Council. So Andy, would you meet me at the podium? Vice Mayor Pease, would you meet me at the podium? <laughs> it's nice to see you. Thank Thanks you for coming. This is an honorary proclamation recognizing September 15th through October 15th, 2024 as National Hispanic Heritage Month. Whereas the city of Aurora Grande is welcoming, inclusive, and dedicated to improving the quality of life for those who live, work, and visit here. And whereas what began in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Johnson and was expanded by President Reagan in 1988, to cover a 30-day period starting September 15th, the United States observe, observes Hispanic Heritage Month. And whereas Hispanic Heritage Month celebrates the histories, cultures, and contributions of those whose ancestors came from, to America from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America, and whereas the purpose of Hispanic Heritage Month is to create awareness of the contributions of people of Hispanic heritage to the American culture. Many people of Hispanic heritage serve as civil rights leaders and community organizers, politicians, teachers, journalists, first responders, artists, healthcare professionals, athletes, inventors, entertainers, and more. And whereas Hispanic Heritage Month is tied to the celebration of the rich tapestry of our community and reflects an array of distinct cultures, whereas Arroyo Grande is fortunate to count among its population a large number of residents of Spanish and Latin American descent, who grow businesses, offer innovative ideas, and strengthen our economy, create jobs, and contribute to our daily lives. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Karen Ray Russell, Mayor of the City of Aurora Grande, do hereby proclaim September 15th to October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month in Aurora Grande, and invite the community to learn more of the Hispanic culture, people, traditions, and values that have positively enriched our community. And we invite you to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor, and to uh, the Council uh, for taking this opportunity to pause in what we all know is uh, busy city work and to be able to take this moment. I'm truly grateful. The, uh, I uh, accept this um, proclamation on behalf of the Latino Outreach Council. The Latino Outreach Council uh, is celebrating 30 years in our county uh, this month, this year, and it's been 30 years of serving the community and being present to lift up and uh, educate and celebrate the contributions of Hispanic, Latino, Latinx community. So we have lots coming up um, for this month throughout the county to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. And then uh, going into November, we'll have Dia de los Muertos, uh, Mission Plaza in San Luis Obispo on November 3rd. And we look forward to um, sharing our, uh, our culture and energy and being um, just a part of this community. So thank you so much. Thank you. And that takes us to item 6B. This is city manager communications, Mr. Downing. Yes, thank you very much to the council, Matt Downing, your city manager. A few updates for you this evening. Uh, for those Monopoly fans who are with us this evening, the Slow Cow Monopoly game was released last week. And we actually have the Swinging Bridge as a place on the Monopoly board. Uh, so for those who are interested, you can get a copy from the creator's website at us.toptrumps.com. Um, next, speaking of the Swinging Bridge, this Friday we will have a ribbon cutting for the Swinging Bridge Rehabilitation Project at 3.30 in Centennial Park, Centennial Plaza, essentially the Branch Street side of the bridge. Uh, so again, that's Friday at 3.30 p.m. And then I mentioned that the last council meeting will be hosting three virtual town hall meetings for residents to receive more information about the, and ask questions about the city's uh, proposed sales tax measure, measure E24. 
Uh, the first town hall will take place on September 19th at 12 p.m. That will be on Zoom, and the Zoom link is available on the city's website. If you want more information, contact the city clerk's office. On a more somber note, and in honor of uh, September 11th, Five Cities Fire Authority headquarters at Station 1 will have their memorial open uh, to the public. And as you may recall, that memorial includes a piece of the World Trade Center, as well as memorial flags that have been placed there by the residents. So uh, anybody who wants to swing by their own can feel free to. And then lastly, we do have two summer concerts uh, remaining in the 2024 season. Uh, so this Sunday from 1 to 3 at Heritage Square Park, you can catch Louis Ortega and the band playing their blend of blues, rock, country, and Latin music. And then since this is the final council meeting before, um, and I won't get a chance to hype up the next one, uh, on September 22nd, you can listen to Quest the Ridge. Again, that's 1 to 3 p.m. at Heritage Square Park. And that will conclude my comments for this evening. Okay, you'll check in with council, see if anybody has questions. So that takes us to item seven. We don't have those because that happens at the second half of our meetings, or the second uh, half of the month, excuse me. So that takes us straight to community comments and suggestions. So before we get started, I did want to just sort of um, reflect a little bit on last time, hope that we can manage to stay within the business of the city council here and remind everyone that there is business to be done this evening. Um, we are keeping that policy of one minute, so if you could please, please just center yourself and think about what you'd like to say as you come forward. We would very much appreciate an orderly conduct at the meeting. So uh, at this time, we'll open up community comments. Come on forward if you would like to speak on items not on tonight's agenda. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Eileen Lowe, and I'm here um, to provide you with a minute of gratitude I want to thank you for your leadership. On uh, August 28th, I participated in a forum for candidates, a briefing uh, that was um, led by your staff, led by um, city manager Downing and his executive team. And uh, I was so impressed by the breadth and the scope of what's involved, of course, in running the city. And uh, their dedication, their professionalism, uh, their command of the information, um, how they presented themselves and the city was just very impressive. And I look forward to uh, joining your team. Uh, I've been out talking with voters in the neighborhoods and I am coming up with a short list of things that of course people are concerned about uh, that I'll pass along to you separately and um, can be addressed um, at the appropriate time and place. Thank you very much for your leadership. It makes a difference. Instead of three minutes, by uh, you know, by the standard of most people in in the United States, public comments are usually limited to three minutes, and so I'm wondering why you would shorten that time. Because, uh, in my opinion, the First Amendment of the Constitution is first for a reason, because we do have freedom of speech in this country, and. Um, and I think Royal Grande needs to get up to pace with with uh, our freedoms and not forget that we the people are the boss. We're actually the ones who tell you what to do and we might need three minutes to do so. As you can see, my time ran out. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you change it back to three minutes. Appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's going to be about seven seconds. I just stepped out of here and just said, City Council's business is to listen to the community. Right? Can that really be done effectively in less than 60 seconds sometimes? This one did, I hope, but a lot of times I think it takes longer than 30 seconds, the president was said, what, decades ago? I don't know how long ago. I've been here for a long time. I don't even know. That was before I was here, and that was 60 years ago. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
My name is Shannon Kessler. I'm also speaking in opposition to the dramatic reduction in public comment. I'll read from the First Amendment, as has been mentioned by my predecessor. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, I'll just read you a definition that I googled of the term abridge. Definition is shorten or reduce. Thank you. Would anyone else have to speak? Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, sir. <laughs> Hi, my name is Victor, and I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm going to convey information for your consideration about a subject that's very dear to me. It's called natural law. If you check out natural law in the dictionary, you'll find that it is a body of unchanging moral principles regarded as a basis for all human conduct. What did I just say? Don't worry, I'll break it down. We all have a body. We know what a body is. It's central to everything. Unchanging. This is where it gets interesting. Real law doesn't change. Man's laws are forever changing, which indicates to me that a lot of man's laws are illegitimate. I call them lowercase hill laws, because a lot of them are not in alignment with natural law, and actually they're in opposition to natural law. And they, take, they change with time, geography, or the whims of the tyrant, the king, or the legislative body. The reason law doesn't change is because it's based on principles. And I'm getting ahead of myself. I haven't got any morality yet. Thank you. Do you want to come forward, sir? Oh, yeah, but here's. Can you just. Hi, my name is Nathaniel. Um, I'm a First Amendment activist. I have I'm active mostly on YouTube, but also on other social media platforms. I've been doing activism, First Amendment activism, for almost 10 years now, but this is the first time I've spoken at a city council meeting. And this issue about the, the time limit was brought to my attention uh, earlier this afternoon by a fellow activist, and I felt it was important to come and, and address uh, um, the issues concerning that. I, mean, I, I think that, uh, I don't, like I said, I don't normally speak at city council meetings. Uh, I focus mainly on public photography and, and that side of the First Amendment. But uh, I, I feel that, uh, you know, I, I've never really felt that three minutes was really enough, depending on, you know, some of the important issues that get addressed at these meetings. But to, to shorten it to 60 seconds, I, I think that's kind of borderline uh, putting a cap on, on, on free speech. So I'd just like the council to consider that. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, thanks, council. Um, I was here to hear about something else, but um, please consider to give the public three three minutes. I mean, it has been there for, for a long, long time. I have, I'm not, I haven't quite been here as long as Steve Loomis, but almost, he's just a little older than me. But <laughs> anyway, I would um, really appreciate that. And I know that people I hear in the community also say that they, um, you know, especially when they're not used to addressing your forum here. So thank you. And because, just I'll take a moment, I know there'll be probably some more people who are going to speak, just to be clear, because we do have new people who haven't been here. Uh, the only piece of this that has been shortened is the part that's not on our agenda. So if it's on our agenda, you still get your three minutes, just like always. So uh, anyone else who'd like to speak on it that's not on tonight's agenda? All right, seeing no one, we'll go to the city clerk. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, hello. Sorry. So just point of clarification, if it's on the consent agenda, do I speak? Will no, they'll be, be separate. There will, okay, be I didn't events. see it on the agenda. So yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Hello again, Michael Pozor. Um, you've already started my time. <laughs> really? And, and wow. if, you, if you would have a little grace, we have a trainee here, so um, just give her oh, a little bit of I'm grace. sorry about that. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. Uh, during the past two meetings, you have finally admitted that your role as a city council 
is to basically help to govern and manage a land use agency. And with that, your decisions can only pertain to city business that is within your jurisdiction. I highly recommend you review your, your responsibilities as elected officials and live by these statements, as by making them, you have proven the legitimacy for our grievances. Here's a recap of our grievances, the flag policy. Your policy is not relevant to land use, city government, nor management. Identity politics and cultural wars. Your diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice policy is not relevant to land use, city government, nor management. First Amendment rights to private citizens, First Amendment rights to voice their grievances. The, da the data does not support your justification for this policy. These three policies violate our constitutional rights. Additional grievances, millions are wasted, special interests like Central Coast Blue, DEI social justice, voter data mining. I just Thank encourage you, so you all to, uh, to read the Constitution and know that we are unique in the world to have the freedom of speech. Just keep that in mind. To continue on, new taxes, why are no other options proposed by the city? Why is it always just increase our taxes? These grievances are due to wasteful spending and significant waste of staff resources. The flag policy, we only need the American state and city flag supplied on the public property. You currently have three flags related to your policy that fly in June. As a council, you have made many prepared statements regarding your flag policy and have personally advocated for a special group that you claim need more rights than others. One of you claimed that this group of people would be safe in your arms. One of you stated that the flag which dis dictates the acceptance of sexualizing children in all sexual orientations, including pedophilia, which is the most important one, by accepting that policy, you all agree, or perhaps you are, a pedophile. My name is Gaya Powell, and I will be exercising my First Amendment rights, and I will be speaking for three minutes. One honoring uh, disabled vets and Juneteenth flag regarding the freeing the slaves. These are emotionally driven decisions and inappropriate statements that are not related to land use, city government, nor management. It is unnecess an unnecessary policy, and revoking it will bring us back to focusing on unity and acceptance of equal liberties and rights for all, which is represented by the government flags. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice identity politics. The city council should not be wasting millions of dollars and staff time to integrate and implement your cultural war social justice initiatives into city government nor city business. Your effort in doing so have caused great division, confusion, and hatred within our lovely welcoming community. DEI Thank you very much like for your comments. a good idea, but it is now commonly accepted as racist, discriminatory, and anti-American. I'm gonna give you one Just as and your time is up. is completely unnecessary as we have our state and federal. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your comments. Your time is up at this along point. With I'm gonna warn that it's a disrupting public meeting. And federal law and we'll go ahead and take a five minute recess from and permit like the discrimination here we'll back in five minutes everybody. this includes wow. in the workplace and for hiring practices we already have federal laws and state laws in place the first amendment 60 seconds public comment nonsensical arbitrary unreasonable and discriminatory your infringement upon our our liberties now include your dictate to provide citizens of their First Amendment right to voice their grievances to elect officials within a reasonable time. Three minutes is arguably a reasonable time limit. Five minutes may be better, but 60 seconds is outrageous, nonsensical, and unreasonable. And it is obviously is obvious to all that it, <clears throat> it is, was implemented and designed to discriminate against targeted targeted citizens like myself and some of the group that have been speaking on behalf of the citizens here. 
You certainly cannot claim that citizens have wasted countless hours voicing their grievances during public comment as the data clearly shows the opposite is true. Your, your attorney claims Arroyo Grande is a corporatocracy and that its policies and rules assert the ultimate law of our great state and nation's <coughs> constitution. Many realize some are trying to destroy America from within by a thousand cuts from our local government on up. Your decision, so that would have been my, my three minutes. I think that's a reasonable time, but since they've left, I'll go ahead and just finish up. <clears throat> from our local government on up, your decision to do just that will not be tolerated by the loyal, constitutional, law-abiding American citizens of Arroyo Grande. It is our moral obligation to allow our constitutional rights to protect us from arbitrary, unreasonable, and unjust laws and policies. It is time that you restore citizens' constitutional rights and that you live by your own admission that your role is to make decisions that affect and or impact the city's land use, management, and business. That is within your jurisdiction. Identity politics, social justice, and cultural role it dictates are not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Time is actually used on public comment in Arroyo Grande, so you can see that's a discrimination on what they're doing because it's not reasonable that they would cut cut our time when there's barely ever anyone even in the chamber to speak. Okay, and it, and it concerns citizen put this together for me or for us, I should say. So we really appreciate all the citizens that understand the importance of our First Amendment rights. And thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. We have a hero over here. What was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm Shannon Kessler, and I just wanted to know where I can find you on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you my YouTube channel. It's called, uh, don't let the title fool you. It's called Ask Me to Stand. Yeah, I just... No, it's oh. called, that's the, I, I said don't let the name <laughs> fool you. Yeah. Okay. The, I just heard about it this afternoon, yeah, so we kind of rushed off here. Yeah, that. thank you for coming yeah. and giving us some, some press. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you mind if I get, um, do you, since you were videoing that, can you send it to me, what you videotaped? Uh, you can look on my channel. Okay, cool. Katie Kitty. Yeah, let me, oh yeah, yeah, great. Do you know my channel? <laughs> you do? Okay. Well, yeah, let me, maybe I even have it here. So mm -hmm. Okay, is that K-A-T-Y or K-A-T-I-E? Kidman. Yeah. Kidman Auditor? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Could you Public comments. So if you have not spoken yet, you are welcome to come forward. Uh, so if anyone would like to speak on items not on tonight's agenda, now would be your time. And seeing no one, we'll turn it over to our deputy city clerk to check in with people online. If any members of the public on Zoom would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. 
There are no raised hands. Thank you. So we'll close public comment. We'll move forward to item nine. This is consent agenda. This is collectively items 9A through 9G this evening. Um, and as is customary, we'll check in with the council to see if there is an item to be pulled. Uh, but before I do that, I will just mention that item 9D is a uh, resolution approving a grant agreement with the California Office of Traffic Safety and approve a budget adjustment. I'm gonna ask uh, Chief Martinez to come up for a moment and just explain what's going on there for the benefit of everyone. Um, so other than item 9D to pull for discussion, is there anything else to be pulled? Uh, Madam Mayor, I'll be stepping down for the consent item 9E. Um, in the past, I've done uh, design work for uh, Adam and Mary Bird. All right, thank you. Um, so we will take item 9E separately. So uh, we'll go ahead and have Chief speak first. Then I will do public comment on everything but 9E. And then we'll have Councilmember Barnage recuse herself. We'll take 9E and we'll finish up the consent agenda. So Chief, uh, welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just make sure I know how to use this credit card here. <laughs> Excellent. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, as shown on tonight's agenda, the police department is requesting you approve uh, grant funding through the Office of Traffic Safety. I want to take a brief moment to highlight some important aspects of grant funding. Over the past several years, the police department has sought opportunities to receive grant funding to help pay for equipment, vehicles, training, and community policing programs. Your support in approving these grants has been invaluable. Grants are a great way to receive funding beyond the department's operational budget. In recent years, they have allowed us to acquire the additional resources and equipment needed to serve and protect our community effectively. What makes this more special is the grant funding market is very competitive. As many agencies are across the state are also seeking additional money to enhance their operations. All too often, items such as this are brought forward for your consideration without recognizing those who perform the tedious work to obtain this funding. Beyond just completing a detailed application, applying for a grant includes meeting specific requirements and highlighting goals and strategies. Once a grant is approved, the grant coordinator assumes the responsibility of overseeing all the grant operations. This includes purchasing equipment, scheduling training, conducting community outreach and education, and managing operations. The grant coordinator is also responsible for completing quarterly progress reports detailing grant accomplishments and statistics related to grant activities and analyzing the targeted impacts in our community. The coordinator works closely with our city's finance department, submits grant claims, and tracks overtime and purchases made each quarter. It is with great pride that I share that your police department has received a, over a dozen grants totaling an estimated $525,000 over the past four years. This significant achievement would not have been possible without your invaluable support, and I am deeply grateful to those who have contributed to this success. I would especially like to recognize Sergeant Jason Castillo, who, over, who manages our tobacco compliance grant, Officer Keta Pinato, who manages our alcohol beverage control grant, and with us this evening, Sergeant Jeremy Burns, here with us tonight who manages our Office of Traffic Safety Grant and, all, and also Officer Alejandro Estrada who manages our California Highway Patrol Cannabis Grant. I thank each of them for their commitment to forward thinking and innovative efforts in pursuing community policing practices. This additional funding wouldn't be possible without their time, 
their dedication, and their interest in enhancing public safety in our community. And once again, I just would like to thank you for all your support, and uh, we're looking forward to not only continuing to uh, uh, pursue grants, but uh, continuing to give these opportunities to this next generation of officers. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. And to your whole department, thank you for always going above and beyond every single officer. Thank you so much for everything that you all do. <laughs> thank you. All right, um, so again, uh, since Council Member uh, Barnish is going to recuse on item 9E, at this time we'll take public comment on items 9A through 9G, but accepting 9E. So if you'd like to come forward on uh, items that are on in that uh, section, please feel free to come forward at this time. And seeing no one in chambers, let's check in online. If any members of public of items 9A through 9G, with the exception of 9E. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? All right, Madam Clerk, can we get a roll call, please? Councilmember Barnage? Yes. Councilmember Seacrest? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Guthrie? Yes. Mayor Reynosa? Yes. Councilmember George is absent. All right, so uh, let's just take just a moment because we can't resume until Councilmember Barnage has. Oh, can you stay? Yeah. It's okay. All right, great. All right, then we're good. So item 9E then. Um, any discussion about item 9E? I actually have a couple of items. Um, I have questions, actually. Is the applicant here? I'm sorry, not the applicant, but the, uh, did anyone from commune here today? Yes. Excellent. Um, can we have one of your representatives, or maybe all three of you, come up and be first of all be introduced? Secondly, I just have a couple comments or questions for you. <laughs> and if you would hit the little button there, if it's not lit. No there it's already on. All right, good. Hi. Hi. Welcome. We're happy to be here. I'm Ryan LaRosa, co-founder, COO, commune. Behind me, if we need three people at the podium, they can come. You're welcome spell, to introduce. You know. We've got Richardson Reigart, our Executive Vice President of Strategy, and James Whale, the other co-founder and creative director. Thank you. Just a couple questions. Sure. So um, my first question is just honestly out of curiosity, because I'm not sure how you did this. <laughs> it looks to me, because I was reading through all your experience, it looks to me that you are representing both the city of Long Beach, but then also individual council members. And I'm not sure how you pulled that off. Can you kind of explain what that, how that experience? No um, problem. Yeah. yeah, I would suggest that that's more of a, um, over the course of our history. So we've been around almost 10 years. We got our start working for council members, uh, lots of different people. And then throughout that, we won an RFP with the city of Long Beach. So we work with them for on-call services. But really, because we're so embedded in that community, that's where we're based. Um, we tend to be asked to do lots of things for lots of different people within the city, council members and otherwise. But really, I would say that's experience stretched over the course of the decade that we've been in business there. Great, thank does that, you. Does that absolutely, that? no, Great. absolutely. I'm just wondering how that, is, how that conflict yeah. works. So now yeah. I understand it's more, it's more sequential. Yeah, yeah, more sequential. Got yeah. it. And then let me get to my second question. So, um, in your proposal, obviously you're following the $225,000 um, ask, I guess, mm -hmm. through the RFP, but then there's the outside of project cost expenses for travel. And my question to you is, what is your estimate of what that's going to cost on an annual basis? I think it's tough to say, but I will say that we're confident in that it's not going to be significant. One, we consider ourselves a local shop. I know that you know it might feel like we're a little further afield and we understand that, but we're three hours away. We just drove up today, it's an easy car ride. We do think that over the course of the time that we're here, there are gonna be segments of the, of, the, of the project where we're here more often. So for instance, we have a strategy section up front where we're gonna be here embedded in the community, um, you know, making sure that we understand it as well, never know it as well as you guys do, but as well as we possibly can. We don't have anything in our project costs that like, in other words, we're not drawing out of that fee for staying here, traveling here, et cetera. Literally the only things that are in there, I think are mileage, if I'm pulling from memory here, mileage and accommodation. Um, we've stayed at the agrarian both times that we've been down here so far. 
Um, we'll be judicious with the amount of people that we send and how often, but I do think that we want to be here as often as we can. In our history, um, you know, for projects of similar scales and sizes, I don't think that it's it's gone anywhere over you know a, a few thousand dollars over the course of something like that. But it's hard to tell until we get into uh, the work and really understand. But it's not going to come out of the project fee at all. When you say it's not going to come, I, I'm confused by that statement because either way, we're paying for it, right? I guess what I'm trying to <laughs> say is that it's part of the project fee. We're not going to add an addition to the project fee. It's going to stay within the project. Except fee. for the mileage and the lodging, right? Yes. It says out, okay. All right. Got it. I think, think we got there. Yeah, yeah. All right. right. Yeah, <laughs> and we can break that down into more of a, a specific estimate if we need, but that. Um, I got a comment for you later. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank you so much. Let's check and see if anyone else has a question. No. All right. Okay. Um, you are, because I'm questioning you, not sure. you coming up, so you guys are welcome to come up to public. No, we already, no, we have not done public comment yet, so you can come up for public comment okay. during the three minutes. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so at that time, then, let's go ahead and open up public comment. Remember, these are items on the agenda, so you're welcome to your three minutes. Would anyone like to comment on item 9E? Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and uh, Council Members. I'm Mary Verdin, I'm the CEO of Verdin Marketing, and I wanted to just take a moment tonight to thank you for the past six years that we have been privileged to partner with the city to promote the Rio Grande as a destination. Ashley Akers, who's with me tonight, and I are both part of the Rio Grande uh, community, and we've enjoyed sharing the special things that all of us locals know make AG so special. The things that become experiences that visitors are looking for and that create lasting memories. We're particularly proud of the Visitor Road Grande work that has been recognized with several industry awards of excellence. This list includes the American Advertising Awards, more commonly known as Addies, uh, the Public Relations Society of America, and the International Marcon Awards. These awards recognize campaigns that move the needle in promoting our city for midweek stays and throughout the shoulder season. We got through COVID together successfully, and even with those ups and downs, have ended our fiscal year 24 with a 49% increase in TOT over pre-pandemic pre numbers in 2018-2019. The past year has seen a slowdown in tourism throughout California, with Slow County as a whole only showing an increase of 0.3% in TOT over the prior year. Didn't take your time to answer when I'm done. So am I to understand that we're going from a local company represented by a couple of people who live here in Arroyo Grande to a company for hundreds of thousands of dollars to represent our community who's not even from here? So I'd like that answered and I disagree with that decision and I think the public needs to know about this. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, Gabe Howell. So I have attended, um, I believe, every TV meeting for the last few years, and I have been absolutely amazed and thrilled at how um, it has evolved. And I really want to um, give gratitude and appreciation to the board that we have now and their due diligence and deciding which RFP to go with and the firm that they've chosen. Um, I do agree with their decision. I think it's very important that we have a it, it, normally I think all part of helping to bring tourism to Rio Grande. I love my city. I walk it every day. Um, B. I think I was put on the commission because I'm older than everybody else and have a different view of of things. Um, I'm a pretty extensive traveler. I don't travel to check the boxes. I search the internet. I get what what um, excites me, um, music, art, food, local traditions. And being a TBID commissioner, I'm, I'm very grateful for Verdon Marketing for what they've done over the past years, bringing Rod Grande through and beyond COVID, and they've done well. 
I'm also a believer in the process which the city of Aurora Grande has gone through to find a marketing firm to offer some different kinds of tools to bring guests to our hotels. It has been a very lengthy process and the conclusion that Commune is, is the company to represent us with fresh new ideas as, 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 as is evidenced by the techniques and the passion that they use in promoting their other cities. And um, they want to know who we are. They met with every single one of the commissioners as well as city officials. They want to know what we want. And their questions were relevant to today and tomorrow. They didn't say they were committed to the present. They showed us that they want to be present in our environment and that they want to be here by being here. They have been here. And I believe that because they live and work in an area where they can objectively evaluate the appeal of our city from a different perspective and how to communicate its charm to the types of audiences that we're hoping to attract, that hope that this new marketing firm will represent a Royal Brandy well. Mr. Gaspin, you you are able to speak now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. So I'm Sean Dasman, the uh, chair of the TBID board and also the general manager of the Agrarian Hotel. While I wasn't on the ad hoc committee that went through all of the uh, people that wanted to uh, get the RFP, uh, I was involved in the meetings where the decisions were made. And I think when the city puts a TBID board out there to be an advisory committee and then the board has an ad hoc committee that makes a recommendation that they really need to give that recommendation a lot of weight. I am not one for change. I love the job that Burden is doing and has done. And I just think that, like Jeannie said, there's a lot of new and fresh ideas that came to the table through this whole process. And while we hate to see Burden go, while we hate to see it go away from a local company, we are excited about the possibilities of this company and what they can do for the city. We are thinking outside the box and we are thinking that in due time, you know, it'd be great to have some sort of a rotation where we were working with local companies and working with companies not local. Public comment. We'll bring this back to the council. Um, do you have comments to make, Councilor Seacrest? Briefly. Thank you. Um, I agree with many of the speakers. I'm I'm sad to see her go, and and they have done an amazing job. Um, I love their stuff. Um, just fresh and fun and really on point. I think um, coastal grandmother, right? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> But I, I understand um, and uh, that, and it it's, seems like a very reasonable and clever idea to look at the audience that we are aiming for and, and see what that audience thinks. Um, and I do respect, I think we all do, the work that that committee has done. Um, you know, put a lot of effort in this. So excited to see what Commune will bring. Thank you. Mayor Bertan? I do want to thank uh, Burton uh, Marketing for what they've done and, and frankly what they, they went through, especially in the beginning, that, that, that I appreciate uh, the, the work that they did. I too, as I spoke last time, I, I really wanted to see a more solid connection, a more results-oriented uh, review of our marketing. And I, I in reading over the, the proposal and, and the specific skills here, I, I do think that that's what we're going to get. 
and uh, I, uh, having been involved years ago when we first put this together and did bring in an outside group, so people who had only done retail. Uh, I will say the limit curve is a little longer. You know, hopefully, uh, we, I think we have the committee uh, available and the, the, the feedback necessary to hopefully bring you guys up to speed really quick um, because it did take quite a while last time. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I've got several comments to make here. Um, some of them echoing a little bit of yours, but we have a little different point of view. So I was the council liaison at the time that we were, that TBID was really struggling. We had an out of town vendor. Um, it was not going well, I'll just leave it at that. And um, we hired Vernon to come in and really to put it plainly clean up the mess. And they did it professionally, they took us to a whole new level, and that's before we even got to COVID. So I do want to acknowledge that that Verdin has not only done good work, but has has saved us in the past from uh, some issues that we had. So I, I do want to acknowledge that. I want to say thank you to Verdin. I'm glad Ashley and Mary are here so we can say it in person. So really appreciate that. Um, I did not answer your question, Shannon, right out the gate because it was a little rhetorical. Um, but also I want to let you know that this is part of my commentary and I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill commune just a little bit right now. So be, be, uh, just know that this comes from a place of kindness and because I am elected by the people of Royal Grande and so my job is to look out for our taxpayer money and for, for um, really what amounts to how we spend it and where we spend it. Um, so the first thing I want to say is we have a lower committee, the TBID, who has done good work. I'm so grateful. We have two members in the audience here. Uh, these people volunteer their time. They do it for free, and they do it without any expectations. And they do good, good work to give this council um, recommendations. They are a recommending body, and the decision does rest with us. But it does beg the question, if we were to override them, why are they there in the first place? And so I don't... I, I don't take that question lightly. And so I'm going to support this tonight, but I do want to just put a couple caveats in here. Um, for those of you who've known me for many, many years, uh, I have in many iterations, not just here, but at Sanitation District, been a, an outspoken champion for local hire. And this is a really difficult decision for me. And so um, to the gentleman from Commune, I'm so glad you're here. Um, I, I just want to kind of put something out there for you. I'm willing to do this and I'm willing to support my TBID members, but I also want to acknowledge a little math here that if we have, I, best case I got out of this reimbursable is I sat down adding up coming for a week or two here and there, coming for meetings and things at just one person we're talking probably somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to ten thousand dollars a year, and out of three hundred dollar round trip just in mileage, um, and that's not really accounting for lodging. So, when we're talking about let's call it ten thousand to make round numbers, to make up that difference, we need an extra half million in TOT, not TBIT, TOT. And from the perspective of this council, that's why we want tourism here is because we get TOT and, and that helps our community, it makes our community vibrant, but it also helps pay for some of the things that the tourists um, enjoy. So my challenge to you is this. Um, I appreciate Verdin actually giving some numbers that I didn't have um, about what our local economy has done in terms of tourism. I expect you to beat that by at least a half a million dollars in that year because if I'm gonna send my money out of, out of market, uh, it's gotta be worth it to the taxpayer. I, I, I actually feel like you're up to the challenge based on what I'm seeing here. Um, I'm, I'm excited about what you say you can do. Um, my kid goes to CSU Long Beach, so <laughs> go 49ers. But I, I'm, I'm happy to see you here, don't get me wrong. But I do want you to understand that from my point of view, that, that is something that, that you need to live up to, is if we're gonna send our money out of market, please make it worth it for us. 
So I appreciate you stepping up to that challenge. For those of you at home who can't see them in the back, uh, enthusiastically <laughs> nodding, um, it, consider that a, a friendly challenge, but it's something that I hope that you can look up to. So with that, would anyone like to make a motion? I'll move the approval of item 90. Second. Second. Are any discussion? Got a little shuffle of staff going on up here, and this takes us to item 11A. This is traffic way bridge replacement project traffic detour plan and parking impacts. Uh, Mr. Robeson and staff. Some exciting information for you. There's a lot of information. Uh, we have been working on this for a while. We've been working with the village business groups and other uh, community groups. Um, to try and reduce the impacts of the traffic way bridge replacement on our community. Um, so, Shannon uh, Sweeney, our city engineer, is here to present those ideas. Uh, we're going to move through this relatively quickly, and um, we have a lot of time for questions and uh, answers. So, thank you very much. Go ahead, Shannon. Thank you, Mayor Council. I'm Shannon Swing, City Engineer, and I'm here to share information for you regarding the Traffic Way Bridge Replacement Project, which is many years in the making. Uh, it has a detour plan. Both of it, there will be some parking impacts, so we're going to review some information and I'm hoping to get some input as well. First, a little bit of background. A uh, picture on the top is what our Traffic Way Bridge looks like right now. That was built back in 1932. Uh, inspections get done on it fairly regularly back in 2006. There were some concerns about those pilings. They were originally uh, 23 feet deep. They are no longer 23 feet deep. Uh, the uh, creek has scoured away of the dirt. Uh, they started having some uh, structural failings on the bridge, noted in 2016. Concrete spalling, dig, uh, deck cracking, uh, and some erosion concerns. So back in 2018, we started securing some funding from the Highway Bridge Program in order to pay for a bridge replacement. The picture on the bottom is a rendering of what that bridge will look like. You will notice there no, are no pilings in the creek, meaning that the problem that we're having right now with um, scouring uh, will not be a problem in the future. Anyway, this bridge carries 11,000 cars a day. So it's a very important conduit in our city. Uh, the, back in 2020, council determined uh, that out of the choices of having one uh, season shutdown, where the whole bridge goes away and traffic way gets closed versus a two year keep the traffic way open and uh, take two years to, to do the work that uh, Council in 2020 determined that the best thing to do would be let's just take the bandit out quickly and do the project in one season. Right now, construction is scheduled for April of 2025 through December of 2025. The engineer's construction estimate for this project is $13.2 million. I think this is the biggest project in our history, so it, it's, it's quite a project. The Highway Bridge Program will fund uh, 88.53% of the project, or roughly 12.2 million uh, cities local uh, funding will cover about $1.6 million of the project. The goal in the detour plan and parking impacts were to keep all driveways and businesses open during construction, and that will be accomplished. There are, uh, I'll be showing you two different detour routes. The first one is a detour in the northbound direction. So you can see that little hatch mark where it says Road Grande Creek Bridge at Traffic Way. That is where the shutdown will be. It will be south of the driveway that serves the southeast corner of Branch Street and it will be back open on Station Way. So Station Way will be open in both directions. In order to accomplish this bridge street, will be converted into 
only northbound. So there will not be two-way traffic on Bridge Street. So you can see if you were going northbound that you would travel up Bridge Street. There will be two temporary signals. One will be placed at Branch and Bridge, which is where the arrow is now. The time. There will also be another temporary signal to help traffic move at the Fair Oaks. We don't probably want about this kind of stuff. Right. So there's a traffic, traffic signal down. Traffic, well, you will not be able to travel south on Bridge Street. So to uh, travel south, recommended that you take the highway or take the Mason to Nelson onto a uh, station way, or sorry, onto a uh, traffic way down south of the closure. By doing so, we can keep this project to a single season and it won't stretch over multiple years. Help move traffic out of the way. Uh, so we are looking into folding that into uh, the project. We talked to Lucia Farm School District who informed us that Holding is building an administration building starting in November of this year and going for 16 months. Uh, so their construction project will uh, be occurring at the same time as ours, but it's good for us to know this because it gave us the opportunity to look at ways in which we could minimize those impacts. We also talked about the buses, the bus barn, is on the opposite side, and so we wanted to make sure that there weren't any concerns about how um, their buses came through. We also had some discussions about Aurora Grande High School and their impacts on traffic in the village, and I'll get to that in a little bit. We had a, a very productive meeting with the village business owners who were rightfully concerned about traffic flow, also about parking, and we'll share some of that information a little bit later on some specific um, stops such as the one in front of the Chevron station and uh, the one at traffic and uh, traffic in Fair Oaks, uh, but there are workable alternatives. For that, Postal Service thanked us for letting them know. Um, Recreation Services uh, is going to be able to um, work around this for the activities that are going on in the village. Um, I think the one that gets most impacted is Halloween in the village, so but, um, we'll be looking at potential alternatives for how to, to meet that. So as far as traffic relief, we looked all over the city. We had a lot of input from um, fire and police and village business owners and the school district about how can we move traffic in ways to minimize the impact in the village. Uh, first thing we did was we looked at anything that was closed. If there's a street that's closed, is this an opportunity to be able to uh, move traffic? That top one, Crown Hill Road, that's Crown Hill Road in Wozniak. Um, that is a challenging intersection if that were to be open all the time, which is why it's mm -hmm. currently closed. However, one of the thoughts mm -hmm. is that what if we direct the construction traffic from holding through this gate? It would be a way to divert that traffic away from, away from the traffic, away from the village. And the school